So I asked everyone to introduce themselves according to a very rigid format. I'm Martin. Um, I'm uh, one of the partners at Index Ventures, which is one of the uh, Europe's largest uh, early stage investment companies. Um, I've been investing in transportation for a long time, both macro mobility, so companies like BlaBlaCar, Trainline, uh, Drivey, GetAround, and also more recently in micro mobility uh, with companies like Bird and uh, Cowboy, which is uh, an e-bike company from Belgium. So I came to the first conference. I love it here, and uh, very happy to be here again. And are you a bikes or a scooters person? Um, I'm, I use an e-bike every day. Hey everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Prescott Watson. I'm a principal with Maniv Mobility. Uh, we're a small team based between San Francisco and Tel Aviv in Israel. Uh, we're unique in that we only invest in mobility, although a lot of times people say only mobility, and we're like, mobility is a huge space, transportation, logistics, last mile, consumer services, uh, autonomous technologies, etc. Excited, excited to be here because we invest uh, pre-seed and seed, and I think that it's a really great opportunity. This is the second year I've been here. It's amazing to see what the team here has done. It's a good opportunity to meet a lot of founders who are just at the very early stages of their, uh, of their journeys. Great, I'm Kevin Talbot with Relay Ventures. Uh, our firm is based in Toronto and San Francisco, along with an office in Menlo Park. I do the transportation um, investing at the firm, and uh, I'm also an investor in Bird, as well as another company that we heard from this morning called Populous. So those are two of my investments. And are you a bikes or a scooters person? I, I'm a scooter person. Okay. Yeah. And what, what were you, Prescott? Uh, I'm definitely an e-bike person. OK, so I want to jump right into it. Um, this year has not been kind to startups, particularly startups in the sharing space. Uh, Uber went public last I checked, which was about five minutes ago. They are down 34% from their IPO price. Uh, Lyft is down 45%. WeWork, as we know, no one wants to be WeWork right now. Um, how does that change how you think about valuations in this space, especially for companies like Bird, like Lime? They raised a lot of money at high valuations very quickly. So we look at the earliest stages of a company's existence. And for us, frankly, as long as you don't have something crazy happening, like people taking money at an extremely high valuation down the road and then having to have employees get crushed if things don't go well, um, I think that it hasn't been too discouraging. A lot of the early investors in Uber, Lyft, and many other companies, probably with the exception potentially of WeWork, uh, have done really well. And I think that though there is a cooling off period, and if you know, I follow your newsletter, it's amazing day to day how much more and more attention is coming up on these companies. But even despite the cooling off period, I don't think it's really changed the economics when you're looking at investing in companies in the earliest stages. There's still a huge growth opportunity. And all of these companies address something that's huge, which is underutilized assets. Um, there are so many inefficiencies all over, all over the economy. I, I don't think we're not discouraged by what we're seeing in the public markets. But I think the issue, perhaps, that you're really getting at is, is the debate over um, growth versus profitability. And I'm, you know, there's a point in time when growth at all costs doesn't work anymore. I think that's what we're seeing with WeWork and, and Uber and Lyft, perhaps. So uh, again, like Prescott, um, we start very early with our companies. And there is a, a point where you have to start prioritizing profitability over growth. And I think for micromobility companies, that has to start with uh, unit economic profitability. And how do you reconcile that with sort of the drop that we've seen in uh, VC investments to micromobility firms this year compared to 2018? Uh, I think it was just... Uh probably overcapitalized over the past couple of years. It's still a very early space that didn't exist two years ago, uh, especially on the, on the scooter side. But even e-bikes are a fairly recent uh, kind of new vehicle. And uh, I think there was a lot of excitement. Um, probably valuations got, got a bit carried away. You know, from, there was a lot of premature scaling in the space. I think, to me, that doesn't change the fundamental um, interest in, in the sector as a whole, and I think we're going to have to be patient. Uh, we're just going through the very natural kind of hype cycle, 
And uh, we, I think we're all through the, the, the worst part, and it's now slowly recovering. Um, I think this is but bottoming up. I, you know, I, was, I was up there on the, on the deck testing the new scooters. It's pretty, you know, it clearly has nothing in comparison with the early scooters in terms of uh, weight and quality and build and, and safety. Um, so clearly the, the hardware has changed tremendously, the operations have changed tremendously. Um, and so, you know, I think some companies are focused on new economics quite early on, you know, Bird being one of them, and I think that's, that was the right, the right approach. Um, and now we just need to be patient, and that's also the, one of the good things with having raised a lot of capital, is that you, you know, it affords you to build the hardware, the operations, the public relations that you need to have in every city, and this takes time. And so how have you seen the unit economics evolve alongside the hardware, like you're talking about? I mean, it's been pretty un, you know, unprecedented in terms of how quickly they've, they've changed and they've, they've turned contribution margin positive. Can you give but us some numbers? I can't give you the exact number. I'll just, just say that it's, it is, you know, on, on the new scooters, it's contribution margin positive post-depreciation, which is obviously the, the, the interesting bit, right? Um, so I think this is a space where there are real scale advantages um, in terms of access to capital, in terms of um, you know, access to hardware at large scale. And um, I think the next phase will be how do you finance these assets? Uh, and for that, you need probably a couple of years of contribution margin profit to get banks kind of comfortable or other type of lender comfortable with financing the asset. Prescott, what do you think about the unit economics evolving? I think I look at it in, in two different ways. Uh, I look at the scooter market, which is a very new type of vehicle class. People don't know how these things are going to perform, or you know, the first indications are that the early iterations of the product performed really well from a consumer satisfaction perspective, but not well from a longevity perspective. That's kind of area one, and you're going to have to have a lot more proof points before you can get debt capital in and actually separate out the assets from the operating company which is going to be an important evolution to allow scooter companies uh, to be, I think, profitable at scale. But there's a second group of companies, I think, that are relying on much more standard, well-known, well-understood vehicle classes, and those are moped companies. Uh, we have an investment in a company called Revel Transit out of New York, and one of the most amazing things about using mopeds is that yeah, it was unclear if Americans would be really excited about mopeds at first, but as soon as you see that people are starting to convert and start using them, the vehicles actually last a lot longer from day one. Um, they ride as cars, so you can really use them for all sorts of other use cases. So in this class of company, I think that uh, that whole unit economics question is actually, well, I, I can say we know that it's, it's actually largely solved, and, and it's, uh, it's kind of downhill from here, so to speak. Although I, I think that, as you pointed out, the hardware iteration in the scooter companies has been really, really fast. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see the leaders in the space, the birds, the limes, et cetera, uh, pull forward and really solve the problems. I think it's going to be difficult for a lot of other companies to replicate that, though. Uh, Kevin, how necessary do you think companies raising capital is to sort of the evolution of the hardware process that we've been talking about? Well, I think the root of the unit economics is driven from vehicle innovation. And, and uh, so you need vehicle innovation, which means that you can't, you, you can't be one of 150 operators all buying from the same supplier. There's no innovation there. You just have baseline. So as, as Prescott mentioned, in order for a company to really differentiate and pull ahead, um, they're going to be producing a vehicle with their own designs, not uh, maybe contract manufactured, but their own designs, and that's where you drive out the unit economics. The other thing which advantages the larger players is scale, because um, if you're a local operator only, you know, perhaps in five markets, you have all of the necessary overheads uh, from network operations and, and so forth um, across a small number of markets. Obviously, the larger players are able to do that globally. So. Um, you do need capital to, to, to do that, but I think the point is that you pour capital into a company with positive unit economics and you have a successful business. I'm going to slightly disagree, uh, slightly, with the idea that only technology innovation is going to solve the unit economics question. I think the reason you see certain companies in different modalities profitable is because, and this is something that I thought a long time, but 
um, Tarani Duncan have shared actually had a really great way of putting this. So I'm quoting her when I'm saying that the actual modality and the way it's used and the style that you write on these things influences the way that users actually treat it. So if you, I used to say something that sounded stupid, which was if you give a kid a Ferrari, he's gonna crash it when he's 18, right? So scooters kind of inspire um, agile movement and riding on sidewalks. Whereas if you're in a bike, uh, which is why we're so excited about bikes at Maneve and, and more so mopeds, people understand their, their you know, considerations, how do I use this in a socially acceptable way? It's also just difficult to weave between people on a bike. So you can actually drive better usage by just giving people a slightly less super fast machine. Yeah, but I, so I was just really addressing, you know, unit economics within scooters, not between modalities per se, right? So I don't disagree with that. Um, but I also believe that we've seen the rise of scooters, if I can go this way, this direction. Go for it. We've seen the rise of scooters because um, certainly in North America, uh, there's just a, a very large portion of the population that will just never get on a bike. They either don't know how to ride a bike or they're afraid of riding a bike. It's not like Europe. It's, it's, a, it's just a different culture for the bike. Um, but so I don't disagree with you. We're not really disagreeing. I do want to throw one, one more point in, um, which I think is um, uh, really important. And, and that is, I, I think another driver of, of unit economics comes down to the very basics of uh, fleet utilization. So you can flood the market or flood the, flood the streets with scooters if you're only getting one turn or two turns out of those scooters, uh, then, then you're also not going to achieve your profitability. And so sort of on this question of like utilization and market share, I'm curious, do you think that micromobility trends toward a duopoly model, sort of like we've seen emerge with Uber and Lyft in the US on rides? Uh, is it local monopolies? Is there room for multiple players? Like what, what does that look like when you map it out? I think it's really hard to, to predict in, a, in a, an environment where capital is so abundant. Um, so today there are cities where you have, you know, six, seven, eight operators, which is definitely not sustainable. I think what you've seen in Paris, which is the closest to a pure free market as there is probably in the world right now, is that at some point there were 12 companies on the streets, and after a couple of months it went down to six in theory, but in practice if you go to Paris you see three or four brands. And can we clarify how many scooters are actually in Paris right now? <laughs> Who knows? Take a guess. <laughs> oh, you're, you're asking me to, to take... Um, probably 30,000. You were saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, very quickly the market kind of became much more rational and, and, and only, I think, you know, in a city like Paris, which is very large and could be millions of rides every month, at least, um, there's probably space for three, I would say, three operators. Um, in most other markets, two is probably a good number. And do you think scooters uh, at Prescott have network effects? I think what scooters have done uh, and this doesn't quite answer the question, but what scooters have done, to your point, uh, is they've gotten people that wouldn't ride a bike to start doing something that's closer to riding a bike. And as consumer investors, I, I'm not really a consumer investor, but as people investing in the consumer space, I think the first question is like, where are consumers spending their money? And it's not easy to get people to change their behavior, especially around things like how do you move, what time do you wake up? Like it's, it's difficult to ask someone to do that. And the amazing thing about scooters, and what is going to be the lasting durable thing that scooters build, is they're making more people in society consider, do I need to drive a car half a mile to go to a gas station and pick up a monster energy drink if I live in Phoenix? Probably the answer is no. And if you get people out of the vehicle and onto the street, there's all sorts of changes that happen. It, it, it enables a wider base of people to go and be policy advocates that will benefit scooter companies, that will benefit bike companies, so on and so forth. Um, and like even this event is very interesting. Like you see people that I would consider, like the people wearing the parking as theft shirts, like those people probably would never have talked with tech people five years ago. And yet you see that what scooters have done is changed how we talk about mobility and it's, be, it's become a thing, so to speak. I just think that more and more people will start moving to what I call more robust modalities like bikes. Scooters are still gonna be huge. And I think that 
there will be winners emerging, but bikes, I think, address a wider array of trips. And so, so on this topic of changing consumer habits, right, uh, one thing that we've seen, particularly with scooters, is that the companies have been raising their prices uh, to adjust their unit economics. So originally everyone sort of charged a dollar to unlock and 15 cents per minute. We've seen a lot of those per minute fees climb. Um, as you talk about changing consumer habits and people starting to take bikes, take scooters more naturally, where is the line between people utilizing a shared version and just deciding to buy their own? In the long run, once you have really solid hardware that can last for 18, 24 months at least, um, and very good operations with, say, swappable batteries, which reduce the cost massively and longer lasting battery, prices should come down. I mean, uh, I think our, our thesis is that the hike is a temporary hike, and that is necessary to demonstrate that you can make money and that these assets can be profitable, even with the quality that they have today and that it's only going to get better from here. And I think that's a big difference. I mean, Travis at Bird mentions that you know, a lot. He comes from um, Uber and Lyft, and he always says that in these businesses, the marginal cost or the marginal driver is less and less efficient, costs a lot you know, more and more to acquire. It's the other way around with scooters. You know, every marginal additional scooter on the street is more efficient than the previous one, and the economics are only getting better with scale which is the exact opposite and which also favors the larger scale companies. Um, so, you know, our, our thesis is that the, you know, the only way today, I think it's, it's, it's the prices is high. Um, and I hope it is as high as it will ever get. And how low do you think prices have to fall for it to be like an appealing proposition to a regular person? I don't, I mean, I haven't, I haven't done the, the scientific Calculation. The reality is you have many different type of use cases. Uh, it doesn't have to be a commuting use case to be successful. You know, it can be something that you do you know, on the day where you want to go out and you want to take your bike, or you, know, you want to take your car, or you're just going to a very close meeting, you don't want to have the hassle of locking something uh, you know, down and, 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 you know, and the risk of getting stolen. There are a lot of other considerations. The convenience part is, is you know, a lot of people are still willing to use these, these vehicles, even at a fairly high price, because they're just so convenient. You go to Paris, again, which I think to me is the most incredible city in terms of micromobility. People just use scooters to go from, from meeting to meeting. So they may take the tube in the morning for their daily commute, but then the rest of the day, they just take, take scooters from one meeting to the next. Um, and I mean, probably they charge it to their employer. Uh, it's kind of you know, almost like a, used to be a fleet, you know, you used to be a car fleet, now you have this, this, this scooter rentals. Uh, so Kevin, I was hoping, can you walk us through some of the assumptions that are made uh, when you do diligence on a micromobility company? I mean, let's start. Do you ride? Is the first thing you do is you ride the bike or you ride the scooter? What does that look like? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, and then? Well, okay. And then I think it's, there isn't something specific to micro mobility. I think then what it comes down to is um, meeting with the team, and any investment that we make is one of these um, sort of juggling of, of, if you will, sort of three balls, right? There's the, the technology, there's the market opportunity, and there's the people. And I will argue, and I'm sure everybody here will argue, that what we're ultimately doing when we're making an investment is we're picking the team and the people. Now, they have to be doing the right things, they have to be in the right markets, they have to have the right approach, uh, the technology has to be differentiated, so you still need all of those things, but at the end of the day, you're sitting down in front of um, a, a team and you're trying to determine if this is the team that you really want to work with and that you think can execute on the strategy. And do you, do, does any of you feel like there's been a reassessment of sort of picking a founder, especially in light of, like we were talking about earlier, we've had Travis, we've had Adam Newman, the sort of cult of the founder is um, suffering to put it mildly. Um, there are two examples, but there are hundreds of you know, counter examples. So obviously the media, those are fantastic, they make for fantastic stories. I mean, I could read about WeWork 
all day long if, if I didn't have a, a job, right? Uh, it's just so entertaining. But you know, I think the, you know, the reality is those are, those are the exceptions. Um, I mean, they have one thing in common. They have, you know, the, turns out they have the same investor. I think that, create, that, that contributed to the story in a way that, just maybe another side on, on SoftBank, I think you know, the, the, the initial idea behind SoftBank was genius. I mean, this, this idea that venture capital as an asset class is tiny you know, in terms of the, econ the side of the economy and the other asset classes, and they realized that if we came out with a very large fund, like an order of magnitude larger than anybody else, if not two, then we could win every deal and see and have all of the deal flow. And I think that's a genius insight, and I was very smart. The problem is obviously it's, it's, um, it's a supply constraint business. There aren't that many companies that can absorb that much capital, and it forces you to invest a lot of money at very high valuations. Which is, exactly, which is what created this disconnect between the private and the public, and that's what we are living through right now. It's bit, so it's more of a function of a fundraising strategy you know, than, of course, the founders had their quirks, but I think it, it was enabled by you know, kind of an, a, 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 a capital environment which was you know, trying to blitz scale the venture capital model um, with unintended consequences, I would say, in some, in some respects. But you asked about the cult of the founder. I think, so first of all, I'm anti-cult in general. Like everything should be reviewed. A good thing to yeah. clarify. So, but I, I think that founders, especially in micromobility, are very important because unlike, let's say, enterprise software or even where we do a lot of investments in the automotive space, we're like understanding very precisely what a tier one supplier wants. Micromobility is such a, it requires diverse knowledge bases. You have to understand, you know, within different cities, why are, like, the corridors of movement that you're serving, why do people use this? How do you design your service from the app to the, to the vehicle to, to match that? You then have to have operational background. You have to be able to recruit a different class, a different type of, of employee, and a different type of team, an ops team, that versus most software companies in the Valley. You also have to have a hardware angle. Um, the list goes on and on and on. And so I, I'm definitely not like part of the cult of the founder, but I, I think that it's very different. And actually one of the things we've looked for when we're looking at companies in this space is it just a technologist, or is it just a group of operations people? Um, like, one of the teams were behind uh, with Bolt Bikes. What I love about Mina, who's somewhere in the crowd, is the fact that you know, this person also was the GM at Deliveroo for a while and understood how the delivery market worked, which meant he understood why this solution was gonna work for couriers, his e-bike solution. He also has really well, you know, good connections into the teams uh, in Australia and the U.S. that can build hardware, that understand supply chain. So it's a very different kind of set of skills you need, and I think that underestimating uh, the team or like moving away from the cult of the founders is not the right thing. It's very important that you're working with people that can handle a business of different natures. Let, let me put just maybe a finer point on this. Um, so everyone that thinks venture capital is all about you know, being super smart about technology or having some master whiz to be able to do finance, I can tell you all we need is a napkin and a crayon. Um, but what, this, what this job really is about is, is picking people. And so the challenge is that you may have a very strong technical founder. The question is, does that technical founder um, move across all of the function? And, and is, is that person able to do the kind of recruiting that's necessary and grow and scale those companies? I would argue, and, and I agree with Martin, you know, these are two fantastic examples um, that, yes, they're, they're like entertainment practically, um, but I think they are outliers, and, and I think that, that, that the, the, the VCs, in a sense, feed that, um, or those VCs fed that. I'm sure none of us would get ourselves into that kind of trouble. We don't have the money. <laughs> and just, and just to, to actually answer your, to your question, you know, for example, the reason why we picked Travis at Bird was one that, you know, he came from Lyft and Uber, so no, knew inside out the same way that Mina with Bolt Bikes. He knew the transportation industry inside out. And two, they were the, the inventor of, you know, they didn't invent the scooter, but they invented this modality with this, with this vehicle. And we thought that in a space that is so early, and that requires just, you know, will require 10 different changes of business model, of hardware, of, you know, we want to back a team that can both operate and can innovate and be kind of first principle thinker in that industry because that's still where we are. This is the homebrew computer club year two. 
So you need the, you know, the Steve Jobs and the Wozniak in, in the room. So, so you and Kevin both sort of got at this point. Um, is there such a thing as too much capital for a company, a micromobility company? Like, what is, what is too much capital? I think, yeah, I think there was too much capital too early in this, as I said, I think there was too much capital too early in the space. Um, and that, that pushed people to scale prematurely with, with hardware that wasn't, I mean, it's well documented, um, with hardware that wasn't fit for purpose. So, but the reality is, again, this is the same thing as, as the SoftBank story. We are in an environment where capital is extremely cheap. Venture capital is still a tiny as, you know, asset class and people have no yield anywhere else. So, you know, this is just a function of that. There aren't that many, the reason why there was so much capital is that people thought they could see, you know, it, the beauty with the micromobility space is that you can see the, I mean, we, you know, we've all seen Horace slides where you can, there's a very rational reasons and a lot of big technological trends which are converging on a focal point right now, which is light electric vehicles. And it's, and, on top of that, you have the environmental question as a background. So everything in the, pla the planets are getting aligned. And, and, when, and so when you find, on top of that, a real consumer appetite, people get excited. Um, but then, obviously, you realize, actually, wow, you need, you need to roll out city by city. You got the, the hardware question. You got the regulatory question. You've got the churn question. And um, yeah, you know, there, there, there has been some, some painful lessons. I, I saw you nodding, Kevin, when I said that. No, you can have, like, too much money actually is probably what kills companies. Can, right. you, can you expand on that? Can you cite a couple recent deaths? <laughs> no, no, that, I, that won't go, I won't go on record saying that. But um, so, so constrained capital provides discipline to the team. And, um, and I think that that's an important thing when you're, when you're starting a company. It, there's this careful balance of when there's too much money or not enough money. Um, I want to do a quick, each of you respond to this question. Cobblestones were in Europe, good or bad? They're bad for scooters, that's for sure. <laughs> and, for, and for bikes, I have to say. So. I, they, are, they are lovely, but I think they are, they are bad experience for my mobility. Um, as a visitor, they're really beautiful, but I'm kind of glad that I live in a city with uh, paved roads. <laughs> Great business opportunity to replace them. <laughs> okay. Um, so, in terms of capital, you know, I think someone mentioned this earlier. One reason there's such ready access to it right now is we're in a low interest environment. Um, how do you think about ways that that could potentially change and the impact that that would have on the sector? Well, I think we've been waiting for about three or four or five or six years for this whole party to come to an end. I'm not sure when it will. Um, but certainly, you know, we, uh, at, at our firm, you know, we just continue to be, I, I would say, prudent um, in terms of the types of deals that we do and the amount of capital that we invest. And prudent means, doesn't mean you don't put capital to work, it means that you fund companies with the right amount of capital. Sometimes that's more capital than what an entrepreneur comes in looking for, sometimes it's less. I used to be head of product at a fintech company in Israel, and in 2014, five years ago, we were in the middle of our Series B, um, and there was both, I forget what was happening, but there was something in the markets, everyone's like, oh my gosh, a recession's coming, and we were in the middle of a war. So we were like, we've got to close this Series B as soon as possible, but it, it never came. And uh, we ended up raising like 70 and just kept going and going. Um, I think what's gonna happen is that if you are um, a luxury good and consumers just do this because it's fun and convenient, you're gonna have a lot of trouble in the downturn because your revenue is gonna go away, it's gonna be hard to raise money. Um, if on the other hand, you're a company, especially in the B2B space, whose product enables other companies to make more money or to stop losing money, you're going to do much better. Um, and so this is why, in many ways, we're looking for consumer services that are not durable goods, but, but things that people will always want because they are fundamentally a better service, or we're looking for B2B companies that are actually like helping improve other companies' core business. Okay, we're almost out of time, so I just wanted to ask one more thing. 
Um, we're about to proceed to happy hour. There is some good data that drinking and scooting is a bad combination. Um, I don't advise it. How do you, as VCs, price in sort of like human risk and accidents and incidents that can happen when you're evaluating companies um, as like a risk factor? I mean, you have single person risk, especially at the seed stage, and it's, it's just part of People sometimes ask, like, why do you always want 15 to 20 percent of a company? And it's because for us, there's a portfolio of teams, all of whom we love and want to be successful. But like, just looking at the numbers, there's always going to be things that go wrong. And so, we we get certain ownership percentages to make the risk reward over a portfolio of options work. It's kind of a, an academic way of answering the question, but that's. Oh no, sorry. I meant literally. How do you price in the fact that people might fall off scooters and so, get hurt? Right, oh, right. okay. Um, but that was a good esoteric answer. People that have SDKs that can, on the phone, determine if someone is inebriated, please approach me, because this is not a huge issue, but I think as we start going into more cities with some of our company, with some of the companies, it will become an issue, and people can actually do this kind of stuff without having to have a new sensor. It will be a very successful uh, SDK for these types of offline to online services. I can't wait for the, the autonomous scooter company to roll out. Then all of, all of our problems will be solved. And we can drink as much as we want on the scooter. And those will be the golden days. Okay, well, I think we're done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.